tensions between the U.S. and Iran suddenly seemed to ease on Wednesday as President Donald Trump brushed off the Iranian retaliation and said he's ready to work toward peace. But how sincere were his words? And how did the Iranians receive them? Then we look at the Australian bushfires and the vast death devastations they've caused. What lessons will the world absorb from it all? Welcome to The Point, an opinion show coming to you live from Beijing. I'm Li Chou-Yen, sitting in for Liu Xin. Now, after Iran fired missiles that did not draw American blood, U.S. President Donald Trump struck a more conciliatory tone on Wednesday. In a live broadcast, Trump proclaimed, Our great American forces are prepared for anything. Iran appears to be standing down. And after a U.S. airstrike killed Iran's foremost general, Qassem Soleimani, Iranian leaders promised their people and the world severe revenge. Instead, Iran damaged U.S. military bases in Iraq, but reportedly caused no casualties. And later, Trump threatened Iran with more sanctions. He also said the U.S. is, quote, ready to embrace peace with all who we seek. So does Trump really intend to de-escalate tensions? And how will Iran respond? And has the world been pulled back from the brink of another war? Well, joining our discussion is Einar Tangen, our current affair commentator here in Beijing studio. Thank you so much for joining us. So let's talk about this. Um, our guest, Mirandi, may be joining us a little later. So let's first start with how do you interpret Donald Trump's press conference to the American public? Do you think that he's backing down? Well, it's, it's, I think he was uh, taken aback uh, quite severely. Uh, almost everybody, every nation on earth, all the people, Republican or Democratic, despite Republicans saying they defend it, said that you're, 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 you're really crossing a dangerous line. You've, in essence, declared war on these people. And if they respond and you respond, this could escalate into a direct conflict. So very clearly, you could see the difference in tone in the way that he delivered this speech as as opposed to his tweets and all the kind of bellicose uh, verbosity that he was uh, spreading out before, how he was going to you know, teach them a lesson and all this kind of stuff. So this is classic Trump uh, things. He likes to you know, say things really tough, and then when uh, the reality meets the road, he tends to back off. You've seen that at the European Union. You know, he, you know, before the meetings, he talks a lot of trash about all of these leaders, and then he goes there and he smiles and tries to shake their hand. But does his remarks suggest that further U.S. military operations are now off the table? No. I mean, here, here's, here's a dis, uh, the, the disturbing part of this, is that Iran chose to de-escalate. They, in essence, uh, the CNN sent a reporter there. She was standing in the middle of the field. She was not standing in an air base. You could not see one military installation. You could see, you know, farmland in the background of this. Uh, the craters were quite small. I think the Iranians were trying to make it clear that they have the range. They were showing the range of their missiles, that they can launch them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think if there is going to be retaliation, it's going to be through the kind of allied forces and forces that are not allied to Iran. A lot of them are going to take this as an opportunity to attract followers, to paint the U.S. as a naked aggressor who's willing to uh, flout, flout the rule of law and therefore it justifies their cause because terrorism is justified if large powers don't uh, uphold the rule of law. Mm -hmm. So that will be their thinking and their point. Right. And in the States now, the airstrike that killed Soleimani, General Soleimani, generated starkly different uh, reactions among party lines. I mean, right now, the Democratic-led U.S. House of Representatives will vote on Thursday on a resolution to limit President Donald Trump's military actions against Iran. How do you look at that? Well, it wasn't strictly party lines. Uh, and during the briefing on uh, the justification for this, this kind of imminent threat that Donald Trump has been talking about, two people from his party have broken with him. And they did not break and say, we have doubts. They came out directly and said, this is the worst uh, and most egregious br briefing they've ever gotten. Mm -hmm. They were, did not appreciate this line that in 1992, Congress authorized the president to do this and that for Congress or the Senate to even debate this was not allowed. Mm -hmm. uh, Congress has the sole power to declare war. They have given delegated powers to the presidency. Those powers can be taken back and that's what's going to happen. These two senators have said that they're going to vote to restrict the president's power, in particular on Iran, not generally. But this could be the beginning of a large-scale revolution. There are a number of senators out there who are beginning to question Trump's line. 
this kind of, you know, you're in my pocket kind of action that he keeps pushing along. At some point, a lot of these independents, especially ones who are uh, running in districts which could go either way, are going to have to make a decision, principal or Donald Trump. Hmm. Now, let me also bring Professor Mirandi, Mohammed Mirandi from University of Tehran. He is joining us now via satellite in Tehran. Good to see you there, Professor. Uh, before I get to you, uh, let's take a listen to what the Chinese Foreign Minister spokesperson Gong Shuang said on Thursday about the current Thank tensions. You. Have a listen. China calls on all relevant sides to respect justice and fairness, adhere to a general path of political resolutions, take practical actions to de-escalate and ease the current situation, and jointly uphold peace and stability in the Gulf region. So, Professor uh, Mirandi, do you think that diplomatic steps can soften the current tensions? I mean, can China play a role of mediator here? Well, it's difficult to say because, uh, as your previous guest rightly pointed out, Trump doesn't take much heed in people uh, in his own country. He doesn't listen to senators. He doesn't uh, listen to uh, uh, people who provide him with sane advice, as I would see it. So uh, people wake up in the morning to see what Trump will be tweeting that day, and they take it from there. So. It's hard to imagine that the Chinese government, or any other government for that matter, could have any major influence in taming Donald Trump. But I think, uh, obviously, the United States has been badly hurt by, this, uh, by these recent events, by um, carrying out an act of war against both Iran and Iraq, killing senior military officials from both countries, has turned people in both countries very much against the United States, and we saw the vote in the Iraqi parliament. And I believe that if the United States does not start pulling out its troops rather quickly, that uh, they will be met with violence in Iraq. All right, let's talk about the nuclear deal now. After the assassination of General Soleimani, Iran itself announced that they would no longer abide by any restrictions on its nuclear program. But it hasn't yet scrapped the deal entirely. Uh, Trump called on the UK, Germany, France, Russia, and China to also break uh, with the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Gong Shuan also said that the unilateral withdrawal of U.S. from the Iranian nuclear agreement, which ignores international law and obligations, puts extreme pressure on Iran and obstructs other parties from fulfilling their obligations. These are his words, uh, and these are also the root cause of the Iranian nuclear tension. So, Einar, how, how do you read uh, these kind of remarks? How to keep the Iran nuclear deal alive? What can we expect next? Well, it's, it's, it's very difficult, especially after this assassination attempt. Uh, I think, uh, around and I'd like to hear from Professor Morandi about this. Well, we'll, from the we'll believe that uh, their only course open to them mm -hmm. is to have a nuclear bomb. The only way that they can go with parity to, uh, up against the U.S. because of the difference in military uh, might. So it, it's very difficult to see how this can be salvaged. Obviously, this has damaged the U.S. in this kind of go it alone. They did not notify their allies. All the allies uh, responded that this was in, uh, not to their liking, some with stronger language. Uh, it's, they're going to be more interested in seeing what they can do with Iran, but the problem is it's not sure that Iran will trust either Trump or the process. So, Professor Morandi, what will happen with the Iran nuclear deal? What's your take? Well, the Iranians stuck to the agreement when the Americans left, even though they were very skeptical of the Europeans even back then. The prediction in Iran was that the Europeans will not deliver. Mm -hmm. But one reason why they did this was because they uh, wanted the international community to recognize that it's the United States who's uh, causing trouble and not Iran. And uh, when the Americans initially, when they first left, uh, the Iranian foreign minister traveled to China and to Russia, and both countries asked Iran, they said, we understand your position and your situation, but they requested that Iran stay within the nuclear deal because that gives the Chinese and the Russians uh, a stronger uh, f a base to uh, resist U.S. pressure. 
And so out of respect for the Russians and the Chinese, partially the Iranians w remained within the agreement. The Iranians, uh, for a year and a half, they were fully committed, whereas the Europeans and the Americans were in complete violation. Then the Iranians gradually reduced their commitments, and now they no longer have any restrictions. But the Iranians are still abiding by the agreement in the sense that the International Atomic Energy Agency has uh, exceptional, uh, an, an exceptional amount of um, 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 capabilities in monitoring Iran's nuclear program. Iranian, the Iranian nuclear program is monitored more thoroughly than any other country in the world. Mm -hmm. So I expect that the next phase will be to decrease the monitoring in order to continue to put pressure on the Europeans to, uh, to, turn, uh, to turn around and begin implementing the agreement. But I'm not optimistic. Personally, I don't believe that Iran is out to produce a nuclear weapon. The Iranians believe that their geographical position mm -hmm. and the fact that Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, and others are very vulnerable and that Iran has very powerful allies across the region in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Yemen, in Af and Afghanistan, and because of Iran's uh, capabilities in the, in the Persian Gulf region, that the United States does not want war. And we saw that in this recent strike that the Iranians carried out, it was a very careful strike. The Iranians intentionally, it's obvious, they didn't want to kill American soldiers because they didn't target the barracks, but they targeted uh, other buildings which were linked to the helicopters of the uh, attack helicopters of the United States. And all the Iranian missiles got through air defenses. All of them hit their targets. And I think that was a strong message to the, Uni to the United States that all your bases in the Persian Gulf region are vulnerable. And those countries that host your bases are also vulnerable. Now, after Trump's address, which stressed that the U.S. has great uh, military hardware, Iranian Foreign Minister Javad Zarif tweeted um, that Trump has been fed disinformation, beautiful military equipment do not rule the world, people do, and our people of the region want U.S. out. I know, how do you see the prospects of uh, U.S. presence in the Middle East? Will they deepen their presence, gradually withdraw, or remain the same? Well, it's, it's very difficult uh, to answer that because you don't know exactly what Trump is going to do next. And uh, there is obviously going to be some repercussions. Uh, I do not believe that Iran is finished either. Uh, I think it, they're done in terms of direct military action, but it's quite possible and probable that other groups uh, allied to them and some not allied will take action against uh, the U.S. military and its various uh, places with it throughout uh, the Middle East. So that, when that happens, the question is, what does Trump do? Does he say we're pulling out, or does he double down? Already there are 18,000 more troops uh, that have been sent to the Gulf um, since uh, this beginning of this year. So at this point, we are not out. Uh, we're actually adding more people in, and it's uh, very disturbing. And what about the sanctions, uh, Professor Morandi? Trump said his administration will impose new sanctions on Iran in response to the attack. He said these powerful sanctions will remain until Iran changes its behavior. I mean, what kind of sanctions may be imposed, do you think? And if more sanctions are imposed on Iran, how might Tehran respond? There are no more sanctions that he can implement or to, that he can impose on Iran. He has done everything possible. In the last few months, all the new sanctions were basically repetitions of previous sanctions. So from here, this is, this is basically propaganda. The United States is uh, trying to prevent Iran even from importing medicine for cancer patients. They put pressure on countries to refrain from exporting food stuff from Iran. So they've gone as far as they can. And uh, they have hurt the Iranian economy. The Iranian economy uh, was growing, and then it uh, lost, it went negative for over a year. But over the past few months, the Iranians have become used to this new normal, and we've had slight growth recently. So it is returning back to normal. The pressure is still there. But the Iranians uh, are uh, more united today, thanks to Trump. Iraq has. Uh, turned much closer to Iran thanks to Trump. I don't think Trump has the wisdom to recognize that the murders that he carried out in Baghdad 
they have actually hurt the United States in ways that um, I think he hasn't even thought about or people around him in the White House haven't thought about. And I think that this is a turning point and it will lead to great pressure against the Americans. And ultimately, I, I believe the Americans will be forced to withdraw from Iraq. And when they withdraw from Iraq, they'll be forced to withdraw from Syria because that's the only way they have access to Syria. I know you want a response to that. You were shaking your head. Uh, yeah. I, I, first off, uh, the Iranian economy is not in good shape, and I, I don't believe that it's uh, had a massive recovery. I agree that uh, Iran is more uh, united than it's ever been before, but this idea that you could force uh, the Europeans in, uh, to, to take care of this thing is impossible. The Europeans are under attack by Donald Trump in the same way that Iran is. So this idea that it's uh, somehow the Europeans' uh, fault for trying to keep this thing together, I think is misplaced. I think it's necessary to work with your partners, not fight with them. All right. That's all the time we have. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you very much, Professor Mohammed Brandi from University of Tehran and also Einar Dangan, a current affairs commentator joining us here in Beijing.